Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction, Tina. It's so great to be back on campus. I was reflecting yesterday that it has been indeed nine years since uh, I took the, the design class that Embrace came out of, so I'm feeling extra old today. Um, so I'd like you guys to go through an exercise with me um, before I begin. Please close your eyes and hold out your hands in front of you. And imagine what you could place inside your hands. An apple, maybe your keys. Now open your eyes. What about a life? What you see here is a premature baby. He looks like he's resting peacefully when in fact he's struggling to stay alive because he can't regulate his own body temperature. Sadly, there are millions of babies like this born every year around the world. In fact, 15 million preterm and underweight babies are born annually. Three million babies die in the first 28 days of their life. That's six babies every minute. One of the biggest problems these babies face is staying warm. And that is the primary function of an incubator. But incubators are expensive. They cost $20,000 upwards. They require a constant supply of electricity. They're difficult to operate. So you're not going to find them in rural areas where many of these babies are dying. In 2007, while I was doing my MBA here at Stanford, I took a class uh, at the design school that would completely change my life. Um, many of you may be familiar with it, but Design for Extreme Affordability brings together students of all the different graduate programs with the goal of creating low-cost technologies for people living on less than a dollar a day. The challenge posed to my team at the time was to build a baby incubator that costs less than 1% of the cost of a traditional incubator, which in the US is about $20,000. So the first thing we did was to go on the ground to places like Nepal uh, and Uganda. And this is what we would often see. So this is a hospital, neonatal intensive care unit that's completely overcrowded. Every baby in here is in need of incubation. And then you have a donated incubator sitting in the corner of the room that's empty. Why? There's no electricity to power it. No one's been trained on how to use it. If a part breaks, there are no spare parts for replacement. So even when these incubators are free, when they're donated, they're not usable because of all these systemic issues. Instead, people use solutions like this. These are old space heaters used to warm babies. You put your hand in front of one of these and you'll immediately feel it starting to burn. Or light bulbs. These are the most common solution in India where 40% of all the world's premature babies are born. But in every clinic I've visited, you hear stories of light bulbs shattering over these babies because of problems with these circuits. So completely unsafe and ineffective solutions out there. From there, we traveled to the villages. And that's where I truly began to understand the problem. This is Sujata. This is one of the first women I met from a village in South India. Sujata gave birth to her baby two months prematurely. She took her baby to a village doctor who advised her to go to a city hospital so her baby could be placed in an incubator. But that hospital was over four hours away and she didn't have the money to get there. And so her baby died. And since then I've heard dozens of similar stories. But it was based on stories like this that we realized what was needed was not just a lower cost version of what exists today. We needed something that could function without a constant supply of electricity that would be easy enough for a mother or a midwife or a healthcare worker in a village setting to use. So coming back to Stanford, we went to the drawing board. We wanted something super intuitive to use, so we created a sleeping bag design. These are literally um, our first sketches of the product on the back of a napkin. And then we thought, what could maintain heat at a constant temperature without the need for electricity? And we went back to high school physics, to the concept that when a material changes phases, let's say from a solid to a liquid, or a liquid to a solid, it does so at one constant temperature. What if we could find a material that melted at human body temperature, and then put enough of that substance in, that that melting period took place over hours um, at a time? We didn't know what the material was, so we prototyped with the closest thing we could find. This is butter uh, in Ziploc bags. We made quite a mess at the D school. From there, we went to a Salvation Army, and we bought everything baby-related we could find, and literally started duct taping our first prototypes together. So if you can see here, um, our first prototype had a tube going down the side of the sleeping bag where you would pour boiling water, and that would melt the face change material. And then we showed this to some people, and they said to us, it's probably not a good idea to put boiling water right next to a baby's head. So we quickly scrapped that and moved on to our next prototype. 
Here we realized that babies in these countries often don't wear diapers. So we needed something, a material that was waterproof and really easy to wipe down. Um, those are the materials we identified here. And then with those early prototypes, we went back to India. And we showed that to mothers, to doctors, to healthcare workers. And with their feedback, we continued to iterate on the design. We realized the importance of sterility. Because these are all reusable, we didn't want babies to cross-infect each other if they were sick. So we ended up creating the sleeping bag out of one entire piece of fabric where there are limited seams on the inside where dirt can collect. Here, doctors requested a clear viewing window so they could observe the baby's breathing and color more easily. And then this is one of my favorite stories. So on the wax pouch, there is a temperature indicator. It's a liquid crystal display that changes color according to the temperature so you know when it's too hot or too cold. And as we showed this to mothers in villages, we heard something very unusual. They would say to us, we don't trust Western medicine. If you gave me a dosage of medicine for my baby, I would cut it in half because it's too strong. So if you told me to keep this at 37 degrees Celsius or 98 degrees Fahrenheit, I'd keep it at a little less than that because that's probably too warm. So that led to a very important design decision to make it a binary happy face, frowning face instead of a numeric scale. And I think that's really the key to, to great design is empathy and, and all of these nuances that are culturally appropriate. When we needed to do more testing, we used our own family members. This is my nephew that I stuffed into one of the early prototypes. <laughs> and so it was in this way that we tested and retested hundreds of times over the course of several years until we were finally ready to launch the product in 2011. I've got it with me here today. So this is the Embrace Warmer. As you can see, it looks like a little sleeping bag made out of waterproof materials. You've got the clear viewing window here. And in the back, you've got this pouch of wax that can be melted either with boiling water or with a short burst of electricity for places that do have intermittent access to electricity. And once melted, it stays at the exact same temperature for up to eight hours at a stretch. And this can be reheated thousands of times. So you put it into a little pocket in the back and it creates a warm microenvironment for the baby. I'll pass this around so you guys can play around with it a bit. So I still remember in 2011, as we were launching the product, in those weeks leading up to our product launch, everything that could have possibly gone wrong went wrong. The electricity in our manufacturing facility went out in the most <laughs> critical moments. A part of our product got stuck in customs and they wouldn't release it. The wash tags were sewn incorrectly, but somehow we managed to get that first product ready to ship to our first customer. And then on the way to that doctor's office, we got a flat tire. <laughs> so the whole team jumped out. We piled into this auto rickshaw that you see here, and we delivered our first product. And I always tell this story because it's so representative to me of what entrepreneurship is all about, which is doing whatever it takes to get past the obstacles that come in your way and finally reach uh, that end goal. And here's our very first customer. The most exciting part of this journey by far has been getting this product into the hands of the families and the babies who need it the most. And we have been so lucky to get the support from people of all different walks of life who have really um, rallied behind us to, to help make an impact with this product. This really led me to believe this quote from Paulo Coelho that I love. He says, when you truly believe something, the universe will conspire to help you achieve it. Uh, a few years ago, we were invited to present our work to President Obama at the White House, and that got great visibility for our efforts. Um, we presented a commitment at the Clinton Global Initiative as well and formed some great partnerships through that. Um, in 2014, Beyonce made a donation to us, a surprise donation that got our products into nine countries across Sub-Saharan Africa. And so with the help of all of these people, to date, we have been able to help over 200,000 babies. The product is now in 20 countries. And I'd like to share just a few of the stories of the babies we've helped. So this is one of my all-time favorite stories. I always tell this one. This is Nathan. Uh, about four years ago, we started working with an orphanage in Beijing. A day after we delivered our product, they called us telling us they had found a two-pound baby that was abandoned on a street in central China. They brought Nathan in, kept him in the warmer for about 30 days. It was a very scary period for all of us. We weren't sure if he was going to survive or not. 
Seven months later, I went to visit the orphanage and I got to hold Nathan in my arms. Uh, he was this vibrant, interactive little boy and it was a very, very special experience. Um, and the orphanage told me this was the first time a baby of this size had ever survived there. A few months after this, we got an email from a family in Chicago saying they had adopted this little boy and were traveling to Beijing that summer to bring him home. So here Nathan is with his new family. And when he turned two, we sent him a warmer for his birthday. You can tell he's <laughs> outgrown it by just a little bit. Um, and the next story, I'm going to show a short video. Um, this is uh, Nasima from Uganda. So it's just a few more pictures of the product being used around the world. This is uh, twins in Uganda while using the Embrace Warmer and a few months later. Uh, and these are some images of the product being used across sub-Saharan Africa. So it's been incredibly um, rewarding and exciting to be a part of, of this effort and, and to create this type of impact. Uh, but I would be lying if I were to tell you that it was all roses and flowers and that we didn't face some extreme challenges along the way. Uh, and it's always wonderful to have a vision of what you want to do. Uh, but as Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Um, and this has happened to us repeatedly, uh, and I could tell you about our challenges for days, uh, but I'll tell you about one pivotal moment for us that really uh, kind of redefined the business and, and taught me a lot about life as well. Um, so in 2014, I'd lived in India for four years. I moved back to the US, and at that time, we'd been working on a global distribution and financing deal with a major medical device company. Uh, so I'd been working on this deal day and night for almost a year at that point. And then about a week away from signing the deal, we found out that this company let go of their healthcare CEO, who was the main advocate for the deal, and they pulled the plug on our financing. We had seven days of cash left in the bank, and I was completely devastated. I had no idea what we were going to do. All of us thought we were going to have to shut down the company. And then a miracle happened. 
Nine months prior to that, I had gone to the World Economic Forum at Davos. And uh, uh, one morning, I went to a meditation session, which maybe five out of 3,000 people showed up for. And I happened to sit next to Mark Benioff, who is the, co -fa the founder and CEO of Salesforce. Mark and I started talking after the meditation session, and I shared with him my work at Embrace. Coincidentally, he was about to um, make a donation to create the preterm birth initiative at UCSF in partnership with the Gates Foundation. So if there were anything in the world that would make me believe in serendipity, it was the universe seating me next to this man. Um, I kept in touch with Mark, and when this crisis hit, I sent him an urgent email telling him what had happened, asking for his help. Um, John Hennessy, who is one of our advisors, also reached out to Mark asking for his help. Um, and a few days later, he wrote back, uh, generously agreeing to fund the company. Um, so I'm just so indebted to Mark uh, for saving the company. We would have, to, have, have had to close our doors if it weren't for that. Um, and it was a really pitiful, pivotal experience in a number of different ways. Um, but one of the things it forced me to do at that point was to take a step back and really reevaluate our strategy. You know, at the time, um, we were selling our product primarily to the Indian government. And working with government contracts can be extremely painful. You don't know when the contracts are going to come through, when you're going to get paid. It wasn't leading to a sustainable business model. At the same time, I'd started to look at models like Tom Shoes and Warby Parker. And the team was thinking, what if we could leverage our technology and create a product for the US market and then use the, the profits from that to fund the expansion of the Embrace Warmers in developing countries. And so that led to the birth of our newest initiative, which is called Little Lotus. And I was just laughing to myself um, as I was preparing this presentation, because this was coincidental, but uh, a lotus, the representation of a lotus, it's a, um, a flower that comes from you know, these dark and muddy waters and turns into something beautiful. So from all the chaos that we experience, we came up with this really cool product. Um, and what it is, it's a line of baby products for the US market, so sleeping bags, swaddles, and blankets that have a technology akin to the Embrace Warmers. The fabric of these products is lined with microns of wax. So this was first used in NASA spacesuits. And what it does, it serves to absorb or release heat to keep babies at an ideal skin temperature, helping them to sleep better. So our informal studies have shown that babies sleep on average an hour longer with our product versus existing products because of less temperature fluctuations. But the real impetus for doing this was to implement a Tom Shoes inspired one-to-one -one model. So for every little lotus that we sell here in the US, we help to save a life in a developing country with the Embrace Warmer. And I think the ethos behind doing this, as I came back to the US and started doing research, I would talk to lots of parents, and moms in particular, I'd often hear them say to me, you know, when I became a mother for the first time, I felt an instant camaraderie with every mother, other mother in the world. And if I saw a baby in need, I would do anything to help that child. So we really wanted to create a global community of parents helping other parents. Uh, another cool aspect of the Little Lotus, you'll see, you notice that there are handprints all over um, the, the front panel of the product. And that comes from an artwork called Touch Our Future. So I collaborated with another Stanford alum, Drew Katayoka, on this initiative. She's an amazing artist. And her concept was to collect the hand traces of mothers and babies from all over the world, from 14 countries, many of whom have been directly helped by the Embrace Warmers. In addition to that, we got the hand traces of the Dalai Lama and about 20 Nobel Peace Prize laureates um, and a bunch of Hollywood celebrities as well. So it's been a really fun way for people to literally lend their hand to this cause. And with the one-for-one -one model, our hope is that over the next few years, we're able to reach a million babies with the Embrace Warmers and truly get this product into the hands of every baby and every family who needs it. So that is my story. That is the last 10 years of my life. And this is where we're at today. And I thought I'd end by just sharing a few of the key lessons that I've learned in this journey. So the first lesson is the lead with the why. I got this from Simon Sinek's TED Talk. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. Um, why do you do what you do? And how does this align with your own purpose and your own values? And this is so much more important than what you do or how you do it. And I think in being really rooted in your purpose and being clear about that why, it will get you through your toughest moments. 
and get you through all those obstacles you're going to face. Um, and at the same time, it will allow you to inspire others and rally people behind your cause. So give a lot of thought to why it is you want to do the things you do. My second lesson here from Winston Churchill, who said, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. And I have a picture of me surfing here, because this is a sport I picked up about a year and a half ago that I've become completely obsessed with. Um, and one of the things about surfing, it's so humbling, because most of the time I'm not on my board, I'm falling off my board, and having to find the courage to get back on and paddle back out for the next wave. And to me, this is the most important trait of being an entrepreneur, is persistence and tenacity, because you will inevitably fail over and over again. And you need to have the courage and that persistence to get back out there, learn from your mistakes, and try again. The other related thing I've learned uh, from surfing in the ocean is this idea of impermanence. You know, everything in this world is constantly changing. And nothing teaches you that more than being in the ocean, where your conditions are changing minute to minute. And what that's taught me about is this concept of non-attachment, to not be attached to anything, including end outcomes. I think I had become so attached to this end outcome for Embrace that the thought of the company shutting down in that story I told you really threatened my own sense of identity. And what I learned from that process is that we are not defined by our successes or our failures. We are defined by our values and by the journey that we take. So as cliche as it sounds, like the journey is truly more important than the destination. And make sure you're having fun in that journey every step of the way. And my last lesson here is to choose to see the world through the lens of beauty. Because we get to choose the perspective by which we see the world. After living in India for a few years, I could see myself becoming jaded and really pessimistic. I was dealing with some of the most vulnerable populations in the world and saw um, so many sad things. I was working in a very corrupt and broken system. And then at some point, I caught myself. And I realized that for every horrible thing that I saw, I saw something equally as beautiful. All of the wonderful people who'd come together to help us in this cause all of the noble doctors I met who stayed up all night in these villages to see patients. The most beautiful thing I got to see in my work was the love a parent has for their child. It's the purest and most selfless form of love in the world. And I realized that a mother, no matter how poor or uneducated or impoverished, will do anything to save her child. And that's the beauty I got to see every day in my work. So I encourage you to see the world through the lens of beauty, because that will give you the optimism to keep changing the world. And I wanted to leave you with one uh, last thought. So this is the Milan Cathedral. The great cathedrals of Europe were built over centuries. This one, the construction began in 1385. It wasn't finished until 1965. What that meant is oftentimes the people who spent their whole lives working on these cathedrals <laughs> never lived to see the fruits of their labor, nor did their children, nor did their grandchildren. So why did they dedicate themselves so tirelessly to building these monuments? I believe it was because they believed in a cause that was far greater than themselves. So I ask each of you to think about what is the cathedral that you want to build, and what is the legacy that you want to leave? My cathedral is a place where no baby dies from being cold. It's a place where every parent is empowered to save their child. And it's a place where the brightest minds come together to change the world for the better, one baby step at a time. Thank you. <laughs> so would you take some questions, yeah, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you said that um, I think Beyonce gave a donation, but your company also was funded. So can you clarify whether it's a non-profit or a for-profit company? Yeah, uh, And then sure. the reasons behind uh, choosing either Sure. One. Yep. So we started as a non-profit, as a 501c3, um, in 2008. That's when we first started out. In 2011, we actually spun out a for-profit arm of the company. And the idea was that the for-profit would sell the product to governments and emerging markets, and then pay a royalty fee to the nonprofit. We really hoped that that would create a self-sustaining model 
Um, uh, at the time, a lot of uh, impact investors were coming into play as well, encouraging us to explore a for-profit route. It was just an easier way to raise capital. Um, so the real reason for doing it was so we could leverage both philanthropic capital to donate the product to the poorest places, as well as private capital to do the more capital-intensive parts of our work. Yes. Can you speak to sort of the design constraints or some of the thinking behind going down this approach versus something like Neo Nature, which is basically, you know, uh, 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 an incubator run by a car battery and a couple of Toyota headlights? Yeah. You know, that was an alternative approach some took. In sure. Time. So I think it goes... Yes, so the question was the thinking behind going behind this design approach and creating something um, that could be used kind of in a home setting as opposed to, there's another product out there that's used out of um, spare car parts, for example, that looks more like a traditional incubator. So I think for us, what the, our aha moment was the story I mentioned where we went into the villages and we realized that we could design for a big city hospital setting, um, but that wasn't where the real problem was. And we really wanted to create a product that could sit in a village setting that would require very minimal training um, because that's where we felt the root of the, the problem was. Uh, I, know, I, know, I noticed that we, we, you seem to be working with people from the region. So are they becoming part of your team? How is the dynamics when you move from the U.S. and uh, to, to places where you didn't have actual partners? Mm -hmm. How do you work with these people? Are they your partners? Are they just helping you? Um, can you talk about this thing? Sure. So in India, we... Um uh, you know, we were situated there for the first four years, so really built up a local team and hired uh, people on the ground, as well as um, worked with partners both in government and, and nonprofit and so on. In other uh, countries that we work in, we do work through a partnership model. So we work with the Millennium Villages across Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we work with a nonprofit in Afghanistan, for example. We've just started a project with one in Nepal. So our thinking there is that we really rely on the expertise of our local partners who are already working on newborn care issues, um, who can then easily integrate the Embrace Warmers into those programs. So it's very uh, unusual that we will have our own staff on the ground. We really train our local partners to implement the product. The design of this is so much easier to use and so much cheaper than the solutions in developed countries. Is there a reason why the product can't enter into those markets? Into developed countries? Yeah, like say in the U.S. healthcare system. Okay, so the question is why uh, can't the product enter the U.S. healthcare system? It definitely can. In fact, we have done a first study at Lucille Packard showing that you can wean babies off of incubators and put them in this device instead. Uh, it just requires a different uh, road in, in terms of getting an FDA approval, for example, putting our resources there, um, and then really changing behavior here. And that's a whole other set of issues because although kind of intellectually it seems like a much easier product to use, changing doctors' behaviors and changing systems around that can be very challenging. And so for the time being, we've decided to focus the warmers on emerging markets um, and really have the, the consumer product here that allows us to fund that. That people in developing countries are very critical in their products. So, how did you achieve that they were less critical? So, the question was how did we get people over the, their criticism of the product? Um, you know, it, it, I, I don't know if the I would use the word criticism, but it did require us to show doctors, for example, clinical studies and show the evidence that this works as well as the standard of care in these settings um, and then have enough experience there that uh, with influencers, especially and key opinion leaders in these markets, that they could influence others um, and really use that word of mouth um, and, and the trust in the product and the company to get it out there further. Um, and so I think that was, and I think it was also helpful for people to see that we had really situated ourselves locally, that we were catering towards the market. Uh, it wasn't just something we had developed here at Stanford and try to implant in these countries, but we had really taken into account um, all of the systemic issues that you know led to the product being more appropriate. Um, it took the first, well, the development of the product took about two years and the clinical testing, probably two and a half years. Um, and then it's been, you know, that was 2011, so it's been five or six years since then. Yeah, and it's still it's still ongoing. We like we're barely at the tip of the iceberg here in terms of the impact we hope to create. And it's been much more challenging. It's taken a lot more time than we anticipated. Yes. 
Jane, wonderful presentation. Two questions. What is the average cost per warmer? Mm -hmm. And how do you pick um, uh, societies um, to to participate in the program? Do they reach out to you? You reach out to them because, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, not, there's a whole bunch of politics and anthropolog sure. anthropological issues. So how do you choose which communities? Sure. So the question was, what is the cost per warmer and how do we decide to go into certain communities? Um, so the cost per warmer is about $200 per each warmer. Um, and that includes the sleeping bag, the wax insert that you saw in a, a separate heating unit. Um, and the product is entirely reusable. And so we estimate the cost of saving a single life with the product, including shipping, logistics, everything else, is roughly about $10 per life saved. Um, and in terms of going into communities, we really, I think a lot of it depends on the partners we'll be able to find. Because with even with a great technology, you really need to ha find effective partners who can implement, who can do the training, who can do the data um, collection and monitoring. And so we really rely on this wonderful network of NGOs on the ground that are specifically focused on newborn care, that that's already a part of the work that they're doing. And then we can kind of slot this technology in. Um, with India, though, we just chose to move to India right away purely because of the numbers. You know, as I said, India has 40% of all the world's premature babies, and so it was a no-brainer that that's where we were going to start. What do you see, what would your talk be eight years from now? What, what will have happened between now and then? That's a great question. So I think for us, it's, it's a couple of things. One is our, our hope is to really get this into the hands of every baby who needs it and make it a, a universally available and adopted technology. Um, the other thing, though, is we would love to work on, on new technologies. And the dream was always, how do we create a, a platform by which we introduce other technologies that reduce infant deaths around the world. If you look at the Millennium Development Goals, um, reducing infant mortality was one of them, and that was the one we made the least progress on over a decade of time. And so it's always ironic to me that we sit here in Silicon Valley with all of this high tech everything around us, and yet so many babies are, are dying every single day. You know, how could that be? And so we are currently working on, uh, for example, integrating sensors into the product and trying to do a remote um, uh, monitoring and eventually in, uh, leveraging AI, we'd love to do um, uh, predictive diagnostics. Yeah. Um, so this product has requires like a really deep knowledge of biology and like healthcare systems. And I was wondering what kind of techniques or advice you had for people who want to develop products in fields that they're not very knowledgeable or experienced in? Yeah, that's a great question because we had three co-founders and none of us had any experience in material science or uh, medical experience and, and we came up with this. And I think the key is really to surround yourself with a group of advisors who do have that depth of knowledge. Um, we formed a wonderful advisory both board both here locally as well as one in India and they really led both the um, clinical studies and con collecting all of that scientific data around the product. Um, and also with this there was no kind of set regulations on how to do this. You know, we didn't fit neatly into a regulatory system and so they provided that deep guidance um, as well. And then once we moved to India, you know, we had this team of people who were really enthusiastic and passionate and who could see things through a different lens. But it's important to counterbalance that with people who have deep um, experience of things like creating a, uh, a rigorous um, quality control system and, and who know manufacturing. So I'd say um, surround yourself with, with experts, either advisors or people that you bring internally into your organization. I'm going to ask another question. Yeah. So this story is so <coughs> impressive. And um, it's one that's used often to celebrate the design thinking process. <coughs> Uh, and you guys were in the first class. Of the second the class. Second class yeah. of design for extreme affordability. Are there <coughs> other examples that have come out of that program and that process that are equally inspiring? Absolutely, yeah. Um, D-Light is a company that I really look up to. So they make very, very low cost LEDs and they came out of the exact same class one year prior. Uh, and I think they are shipping something in the order of 100,000 units a month. Uh, and so in terms of, of scalability and really finding that sustainable business model, in addition to a cool technology, uh, they've really nailed it. Great. Well, if we don't have any questions, I'm sure you'll agree this has been incredibly inspiring. Please join me in thanking Jane Chan. <laughs>